Tonight, actor Ray Winston, as you've never seen him before. In October 2004, a fight occurred here involving a lot of kids from the estates in the surrounding area. A 21-year-old man was killed, and two men were later convicted for his murder. The TV detective turns real-life investigator. I've spoke to um, members of Sam's family, but now I'm going to go and talk to uh, the kids that were there that night, and hopefully at the end of it, I'll have a little bit more evidence. Searching for answers to a question of murder. Was Sam Allen there? No. Sam Allen there? No. Was Sam Allen there? Sam Allen on the mat? Yeah. 100% no. Good evening. The actor Ray Winston is celebrated both for his portrayal of South London villains and for his role as ITV1's private detective, Vincent. That's fiction. But when his nephew's friend was convicted of murder, Many people who witnessed the crime claimed there'd been a terrible miscarriage of justice. And a campaign to overturn the conviction has gathered momentum. Ray Winston decided to use his family contacts to investigate the case himself. This is his special report on a question of murder. It's Vincent! You can't hide in the dark river, Gary! You killed her, Gary! She's dead! You killed her! Vincent? This is me in my day job, playing the role of private detective Vincent in the ITV1 drama. He's in the loft and he's invited me up. But that's acting. Now I'm on the trail of a real-life case. It's all about the terrible consequences of a dispute between two groups of young men in East London. In October 2004, a fight occurred here involving a lot of kids from the estates in the surrounding area. A 21-year-old man was killed and two men were later convicted for his murder. The victim was 21-year-old Osias Kazahun, a shy and happy man who was training to become a chef. His brother and foster parents were devastated at his death. Asias died after trying to help a friend who was being attacked by a gang of youths on October 11th, 2004. Two days earlier, there had been a most trivial incident where one boy had apparently looked at another boy in a disrespectful way. And from that little trivial incident, uh, the boy who thought that he'd been disrespected got together with a group of his friends and they lay in wait for the, the boy who'd, who'd looked at him a couple of nights later. The group of friends were from the Oxton area, and their target was a 19-year-old from the White Cross area. There was no racial element to this incident, but for years there had been disputes between young people from the two neighbouring areas. The group from Oxton that gathered that night were wearing hoods, making it difficult for witnesses to identify who was present, but Several were seen carrying baseball bats and others knives. As they moved from Oxton to White Cross, they were joined by many others, curious to know what was going on. Me and my friend walked down to where the crossroads is, looked down towards Bath Street, and we see like 40 people down there. Like, so we've walked down there because we noticed a few people that we knew down there. So we've walked down there, and then we see it all kicking off. Like. At around 8.30 that evening, the target from White Cross met up with some friends, including Asias Kassahun. He walked towards Bath Street and found the Oxton group lying in wait for him. Hey, come here, man. Guys, come around the corner. Some other boys walked up to punch him. He swung for him. The boy that's come around the corner has ducked the punch and punched the other guy. The guys fell on the floor. And then a couple of, like, four or five other people's run in to try and beat the guy up that's, run around, that's come around the corner. And he's fought a couple of them off. And then his friend come in. That tried, the guy that died, he come in to try and help his friend fight them off. Like. When he saw his friend attacked, Asaeus went to his assistance, uh, and for his pains, he, he was beaten to the ground, and he was then hit with an implement that was either a knife or a baseball bat with a sharpened screw protruding from one end, and that penetrated his skull, and that caused a fatal injury from which he died. Seven men were charged with the crime, 
and two were eventually convicted. One was Bullebeck Ringbyong. At court, one witness told how they'd seen him with a bloodstained knife, another that he admitted responsibility. The other was Sam Hallam. He was convicted after two witnesses claimed they saw him in the general melee. I first became aware of uh, Sam when my nephew was telling me all about him and my sister, who know the family really well, uh, were talking about this kid who's been nicked for murder. And they telling me how innocent Sam was and there was no evidence. And I guess you think at the back of your mind, you know, well, there's no smoke without fire. You know, he might have been there. Uh, he might have been involved in it in some way. But there were no forensics to link Sam with a crime and no CCTV evidence of him even being in the area. Now, my 20-year-old nephew, Bobby, is best friends with Sam. He's convinced Sam is innocent and that he has suffered a miscarriage of justice. You tell me a little bit about Sam. Well, as you know, he's my best mate. Yeah. And uh, what can I say about him? Nice geezer, help anyone, do anything for anyone. Yeah. Definitely, I can't believe what's happened now they picked him out. What was he like when he was out, if it was a fight or anything? I mean, boys do get in the fights yeah. and get in the scrapes and all that. Nothing, not a troublemaker, nothing like that. There were just two people who placed Sam at the murder. Many others who saw the fight told the police that Sam wasn't present. But they weren't all called to the trial to give evidence. Since the trial, more new witnesses have come forward to say they saw the murder and that Sam was not there. You'd have seen, like, the people that were actually uh, doing this, doing the act. Yeah. Yeah, and was any of these Sam? No, no, none of these boys was Sam. And you knew Sam? Yeah, I knew Sam. You know Sam, yeah? Yeah, I know Sam, and if, I, if he would have been there, I would have definitely, no, 100% seen him. No, OK. There's no chance I would have missed him. I got you, yeah, yeah. You, you, know, you know Sam now? Yeah. yeah. Was <laughs> Sam Allen there? No. Sam Allen there? Was Sam Allen there? And how long have you known Sam for? I've known Sam for five years, five to six years. Right. Um, we went to the same secondary school together. And was Sam Allen there? Sam Allen on the mat? Yeah. 100% no. 100% no. Now, I've got to ask you this. There is a kid that's been killed here this night. Yeah, you know, of course. And don't deserve to be dead, you mm. know? So uh, even if your mate had done something like that, it's very hard to come out and say... But it's not in his nature, okay. really. Like, as um, from the five years I've known him, like, he weren't really that type of person, like, Tom. Be a bad boy and that. No, there was a lot of boys that went to the school, they carried like weapons with them around, like Sam weren't really of that nature. The prosecution case against Sam relied on the word of two young people who said he was there. The first witness was a friend of the victim, who was 17 at the time. She had seen a black man hit the victim with a baseball bat and immediately after told the police the names of four people who she thought were involved. Although they vaguely knew each other at that stage, she did not name Sam Hallam. She then heard a rumour that someone called Sam was involved in the fight, and two days later, just after she received a phone call to say that Asias had passed away, she saw Sam in the street. She was walking in a nearby street with a friend of hers, and Sam Hallam ha happened to walk in the opposite direction. And this girl had been speaking to her friend and had been telling her about what had happened two days before and how people were suggesting that somebody called Sam might have been involved. And her friend then said, well, that's Sam Hallam. And they accused Sam in the street. He denied it. But the first girl then made a statement to the police saying that she recognised Sam as somebody that she had seen walking away from the, the actual fight. We were outside the off-licence when a boy walked past me. I immediately recognised him as one of the boys who attacked us, say us. But in court, the witness agreed with the proposition that it might not have been Sam, but someone who looked like him. Once she had said to me in cross-examination that I, I can't say I'm sure it was Sam Hallam, the prosecution naturally uh, re-examined her about that. And she said, well, I did believe when I saw the boy two days later, but he had been the same boy that I'd seen in the street on, on the 11th. But then she added these strange words. I suppose I was just looking for someone to blame on the spot, really. The second witness to name Sam was also a friend of the victim. 
In his first interview, he described a white boy on a BMX bike who pulled out a baseball bat with a protruding screw. He said he couldn't see the boy's face because the hood of a gap top he was wearing was pulled tightly around his face. He said all he knew was the boy had blondish hair. But days later, he spoke to the female witness who told him that Sam Hallam was the boy at the fight. He then made a second statement to the police identifying the boy on the bike as Sam Hallam. As soon as I was reminded of the boy, boy's name, I knew the boy with the baseball bat as Sam Hallam. Whereas the first witness had placed Sam at being at the fight, this witness now placed Sam as virtually standing over the victim with a baseball bat in his hand. In court, though, this witness tried to go back on their second statement. In evidence, right from a word go, he tried to distance himself from that second statement, and he explained that he'd been upset when he'd made that statement because his friend had just died and because he'd just been given this name by the girl, but he maintained throughout, whether he was being questioned by me or questioned by the prosecution, I did not see their face. The boy was wearing a hood, the hood was tightly done up, and he demonstrated, tightly done up, round the face, so that he couldn't see the face at all. What's important, in my mind, is what evidence was not found. I mean, there was no forensics. There's no CCTV. Um, there's nothing saying that Sam Allen didn't own a silver BMX bike during or before or after the murder. In fact, at the time, he didn't own a bike at all. Um, the evidence of this uh, gap top that the uh, boy on the silver BMX bike was wearing, the gap top, um, nothing like this was ever found in Sam's possession. The police could only find evidence that Sam wore Nike tops. And what about the second witness's claim that the man he saw had blonde hair? Sam's hair is brown. The whole case against Sam depended upon the identification of the two witnesses. If the two people who were there can't say they were sure it was Sam Hallam, uh, how, how can a jury? So why did the jury convict Sam? Well, the case was fiendishly complicated. Remember, there were seven people in the dock, but the murder weapon was never found, and there was no forensic evidence to link any of the defendants to the case. Could it have weighed heavily on the court that when Sam was arrested, he exercised the right not to answer any police questions? No comment. Possibly more crucially, he didn't have an alibi. When Sam was first arrested, he told police that he was playing football just under a mile away from when the fight took place. But the problem was, his alibi didn't stand up. To find out more, I met up with Sam's two older brothers, Danny and Terry. Danny, what well, can you tell me about the lack of Sam's alibi? He wasn't sure where he was, and then he said that he was with his friend. And then, I don't know, his, his friend said that he wasn't with him. Unless you're ready for something, you don't know. I don't yeah. know what I was doing last Thursday night, you know. And and it was ten days later, at least, yeah. as well. Sam's friend said he wasn't playing football with Sam on the night of the murder. Although, when questioned in court, he did say he could have been mistaken. Lack of alibi for a murder is something I have personal experience of, and I was completely innocent. Fifteen years ago, I was... I was watching the telly with my wife, and uh, a photo of me came up on something like Crime Watch, one of those programs, and uh, we were laughing. You know, that really does look like me. Uh, two weeks later, there was a knock on the door, and it was the police. And I was taken away to Leeds, banged up on a 72-hour bang-up. I didn't know where I was on the the time, the day that this um, this murder and this attack took place. Because, you know, I remember when Elvis died. I remember where I was. I remember where John Lennon died, where I was. But um, I didn't remember. I couldn't tell you where I was last Thursday. I, I couldn't tell you where I was when this took place. My experience spurs me on to find out more about Sam's case. There are CCTV images that show the crowds of people as they walk from Oxton towards Bath Street, where the fight took place. You can see many of the others charged with murder, but the jury later decided they'd only been present as witnesses and not actually participated in the attack. Sam can't be seen in these pictures, anywhere near the scene. And the police told the court they could find no images from that night of a white boy on a bike 
as a second prosecution witness had claimed. I've spoke to um, members of my family and I've spoke to members of Sam's family, but now I'm going to go and talk to uh, the kids that were there that night and hopefully find some, some new kids that were there that night, uh, people that were arrested who uh, were let go. So, and hopefully at the end of it, I'll have a little bit more evidence. Come around this way. Jermaine McKinney and Danny Martin are two boys who were there that night. They themselves were also charged with murder, but they were acquitted. They agreed to take me down to the murder scene to show me exactly where the fight took place. So this is the doorway where uh, the fight, the first part yeah, of the fight happened. Yeah, this where it started happening, here, this bit here. This yeah. actually happened. Yeah. yeah. And I was standing over there where them, them men are. You've got you, yeah. And I was coming from up there. Where'd you end up? Uh, like I ended up, first I ended up, I was over there by the bins, then yep. I come obviously closer to that, the lamp posts. Right. And how many people were around the door here when it was all taken place? <laughs> that, about... <coughs> it... From that, that pole there, Yeah. that all of this was full up. This full up of people, road. yeah, all of it yeah. was full up of people. But there was only about, I'd say about eight or something around the, the door that actually there. Danny and Jermaine were both in positions where they could see the fight. They were shocked when a couple of days later they heard that people were talking about Sam Hallam being involved. They say they hadn't seen him at the fight, and in fact, Jermaine says Sam knew nothing about the fight until he was told about it. You saw, I think you saw Sam a couple of days later, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I said to him that something happened over that around here, and they're, they're saying that you're, you was involved, that, that me and you were involved, so that be careful when you're around there. That. And he, obviously he didn't know what, was, what I was talking about that, right. until I told him, and then... A couple of days later, that his brother told me that the police came and arrested him for it. Yeah, I got you, yeah. But he weren't nothing to do with it. Let me ask you two something. Do you think he done it? No. no. Do you know he didn't I do know it? for a fact he did. Right. Yeah, 200% he didn't do it. Despite the defence highlighting what they saw as a lack of evidence, and despite his previous good character, the jury convicted Sam. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the order that he should serve a minimum of 12 years. Sam's family were devastated. How do you feel inside? I mean, do you, do you, do you think it's really a mistake? Do you think well, maybe he done it? Maybe he was there? Or? No, because there was youths coming up. My mum saying he wasn't even there, the youths that were at the scene. Right. Tell me when, um, um, how you felt and how you reacted to the news that, you know, oh, just the court cases come to an end and they, and they say he's guilty. I just thought I want my mum. Yeah. But, um, and I remember coming back and I did ring Bob in the cab. Yeah. yeah. Sam's family couldn't believe that Sam was found guilty. I know my nephew Bobby was absolutely devastated. Take a minute, Angel. Come here. Come. I can only heard at the back. After the guilty verdict, the family arranged a meeting at the local community centre to discuss Sam's conviction. 200 people attended. So this is the CCTV. Okay, uh, this uh, was taken on the, uh, the estate. Um, near Paul May has worked on many successful miscarriage of justice campaigns, including the Birmingham Six and the Bridgewater Four. He has now started up the Sam Hallam campaign. So can you tell us why you got involved with this? First of all, this is a very young person who, um, in, in our belief, is in, in entirely innocent, who's serving life imprisonment. Mm. Um, it's completely wrong that... Um, uh, the inconsistent testimony of um, uh, two witnesses, which is riddled with anomalies and discrepancies, should be the basis on which this young man is, um, is uh, serving life imprisonment. Um, so uh, a number of us got involved because uh, we very strongly feel that a miscarriage of justice has uh, taken place yeah. and um, that um, Sam Hallam should be uh, freed from prison. I've gone through all the paperwork. For what I know, I've looked at all the evidence, I've looked at photographs, I've spoke to people. I know the background of the kid mm -hmm. um, through a family of mine. And, and I cannot, for the life of me, sit, putting myself in a, in a place of a juror, see how I can come to the conclusion of guilty. Um, we think it was um, a highly significant um, uh, factor in Sam Hallam's conviction that um, the trial judge um, said that the um, male witness had um, agreed with a police statement that he had made. He had agreed that he had made it. He had actually disowned it at trial, but right. um, uh, the jury could be forgiven for thinking that um, their memory must be uh, inadequate um, 
or defective and uh, the, the trial judge um, had got it right when in fact the trial judge had got it wrong. For meeting uh, Paul today, uh, a man who's worked on um, many of these cases, who only seems to take cases where he has a gut instinct and he reads the facts. This is a, a, an intelligent man uh, who's who coming to this case uh, not knowing the family, not having any connections with the family. So for me, it's just made, it, it's, it's kind of um, made my feelings about it a lot stronger. Earlier this year, Sam's case was heard at the Court of Appeal on the grounds that the identification evidence against Sam was so unreliable it should never have gone before a jury. The appeal court ruled that the warning the judge gave to the jury had been sufficient. Sam's family are now preparing to take the case to the Criminal Cases Review Commission. How often do you get to talk with them? Uh, get to go and see him about twice a month. Twice a month, yeah. And what Sam has now been in Aylesbury Young Offenders Institute for three years. His family all miss him terribly, including his 11-year-old sister, Daisy. So how often do you get to talk to Sam? Um, like, when he rings up, like, on Saturday and mm. stuff. Yeah, and have you been along to see him? Yeah, what was that like? It's nice to see him because well, I don't see him for such a long time. Yeah. It's just really a nice feeling. Yeah. It's hard to be certain exactly what happened on the night of the 11th of October 2004. All we know is that a stupid teenage fight over nothing has destroyed three young people's lives. Bullebeck Ringbyong, found guilty of murder. Sam Allen, a young man who many now believe is innocent, serving life for an offence they say he didn't commit. And the needless and shameful death of Osias Kasselhorn, who died trying to help a friend. Actor Ray Winston reporting. Osias Kasselhorn's family declined to take part in tonight's programme, they said it was distressing to hear about the Sam Hallam campaign and feel it distracts from the tragedy of their son's death. They believe Sam is responsible for the murder. The Metropolitan Police, who led the inquiry, say the case was thoroughly investigated and reviewed by the Crown Prosecution Service before being heard by a jury. They say they respect the decision of the jury and the Court of Appeal. And there is more information on our website at itv.com forward slash tonight. Coming up next Monday, barred from the NHS. As some smokers and overweight patients are banned from surgery, is refusing care justified on medical grounds? Or is this simply a cost-cutting exercise? Morland Sanders meets the patients and their families angry at being denied treatment because of their lifestyles. We got down to Southampton in the morning. He had all the tests done and in the afternoon, the surgeon came along and asked him if he was still smoking. John said yes, and he said that he wouldn't operate on him. And that's all we have time for tonight. So from all of us here, goodbye and thank you for joining us.